Wonderful. If you have your Bibles on you, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 4 today. And that'll be our, our starting point of this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And before we're about to, to walk and enter into God's Word, into a story that maybe a lot of you may have heard before or familiar with or just kind of have a little bit of an understanding, let's again go to God in prayer and go, God, uh, illuminate our minds and our hearts to your Word. Because one of the things that we learned last week is that God has to do this work on our minds and hearts. So let's go to Him as we pray to Him to do exactly that. Father, once again, we come before you and we thank you and we honor you and your name that we just sang about. And Lord, as, as we sing about your name, now we want to go into your word, your revelation that you've given to us, your children. And Lord, it's, it's so easy. I know it's easy for me. I know it could be so easy for all of us to, to enter into a place where you know, we just progress through this life and not take a chance to just stop and read your word and, and see what you have for us and have it speak to us. And so, Lord, this morning, my prayer, my, my desire, my want is that you will be speaking to every single mind and heart in this room this morning, Lord, every single mind and heart through your word. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, what a fantastic song that we just sang. And I just want to feed off of that song that we just sang by saying this, because we were just singing about the Lamb of God. God sent a lamb on a mission. In his sovereignty, the God of the universe ordained from the foundations of the world that this lamb should go to an altar to be sacrificed and to be slain. This lamb, according to the scriptures, was led to a slaughter. And this lamb did not open his mouth. He did not turn to the left or to the right, but he set his face towards Jerusalem, to the place of that sacrifice. Now, here's my question to all of us. Do you think that happened by chance? That just happened by chance? Do you think the Lamb of God went to die and go to a cross at the time of history that this Lamb named Jesus went to that cross? Was it all by chance? Or do you sit here this morning and as you think about what I'm saying, do you believe that from the foundation of the world, freely, immutably, without changing, by the wise counsel of God's own will, ordained that Jesus Christ would go to a cross to die on your behalf and mine. Did he ordain that? See, one of the things that we all can get caught up in is coming to this concept or this thought or this belief or this understanding of how we live out our lives that the things that happen to us are, are happening to us by chance. We're either lucky or we're unlucky. But if God is God... And if God is sovereign, like we talked about last week, then nothing can happen by chance. But do you really believe that? Do you think that God has left not only the redemption of you, but the redemption of all souls that have ever come to faith in Christ and the ones that will still come to faith in Christ? Has he left that up to chance as well? Now, as we think about that and as we stir about that, I also want you to think about this. Will God succeed in his mission? Because we have a heart, a nature of God, a missionary nature of God, meaning our God is on a mission. He has a plan and a purpose. And a lot of times we will go to people, especially as we're looking to evangelize. And if it's your first time here, thanks for being here. We're in the middle of an evangelistic series, an evangelism series basically saying, we know that we have been commissioned as Christians to go share this wonderful good news to those who have never heard it. And even to those who have heard it and rejected it, we still go to them. And even if they rejected it five and six and seven and a hundred times, we still go to them because the people sitting in this room have all rejected this wonderful, beautiful gospel, if not once, thousand times over before God has moved and changed and transformed our hearts. So we know that we're to go. And we will tell people as we go witness them that God has a plan and purpose for your life. Do we not say this? 
And it's true. God does have a plan and a purpose. But do we really believe that, or do we believe that all things are happening just, just by chance, by, by coincidence, by luck, maybe, we will call it? What is God doing on his mission? Well, he sends his incarnate son to this earth. That is Christmas, right? And Christ is the key to everything. The key to everything in history, in this world, in humanity, about God, about salvation, about his mission, it all, the apex of this is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the very nature of God. And here's what God is doing on this mission. Out of this redemptive, called out group of people, which was once Israel, and a lot of times we give Israel a bad time, but if you think about when Paul is going out and and sharing this, this gospel, the new covenant, where is he going to? Do you remember? Like he's constantly going to a certain place in certain cities. He's going to something called a synagogue, which meaning the Jews did leave Israel to go about to the ends of the earth to look to share their faith about the one true living God. That's why the Jewish people were planted in many different cities and towns and countries at the time of Jesus, making it a very, almost like it was designed this way, um, able for a guy like Paul, a Jewish Pharisee who's been converted to Christ, to be able to walk into synagogues and be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus himself was their savior that was promised through their scriptures. So we see that God had called out this redemptive community, this this called out group of people. And God is still doing the same thing. It hasn't changed. God still has a called out, chosen one community of people, and he calls those people his family or his church. And that family and that church is to be on a mission, the same mission that God is on. So the nature of God and the nature of his church is to do what? to seek and save the lost. Well, why does God want to do this? Why is this God's mission to begin with? Well, God is looking to have himself be exalted and glorified. The perfect one knows what you need and what I need. And since he's the good, perfect, righteous one, he knows that the best thing that we need as his creations is him himself. And so he's on this redemptive plan to redeem himself and to show forth who he is, and to show forth his glory. Now, here's a couple of quick verses. We've been doing this one a lot this year, so a lot of you know it, but let me just read it again. Matthew 28, 19. This is the Great Commission. We're looking at this missionary-based nature of God. He's calling you and I, this, this redemptive community, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans 8.29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image. So here's what we're seeing just real quick. God has called his redemptive community to go reach the lost. We see that Jesus' mission the exact imprint of God according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ himself, the second person in the Trinity, is on a mission to seek and save the lost. So if this is God's mission, this is what God's doing, and we are in God's family as fellow believers, saved and redeemed by him, should we not be on the same mission? Because Romans 8, 29 says that one of the things that God is doing into the lives of Christians, people who have have repented and believed upon Christ and are in this process called sanctification, In this process of sanctification, the scriptures say that God is looking to conform you or to make you more into the image of Christ. So the point of salvation to the point of where you're at today, you're becoming more and more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, what is Jesus Christ like? Well, Jesus Christ's mission was to seek and to save the lost. So our purpose as a people is we want to give people an opportunity to hear this good news. We want people to understand this good news, and we want to give people an opportunity to respond to this good news that we call the gospel. Now, how do we do that? How how are you and I to do this? Well, one, we should live out our faith faithfully and obediently, amen? And as we do that faithfully and obediently, the Bible says that you and I will have good works and good deeds. We will do good things for culture and for society and, and for our countries. And as we live out our faith in faithful obedience, 
We can't just stop there. This is what we learned last week, that according to Romans 10, it's not just living out our faith, being kind and love our enemies and pray and do great things for culture and for society. But the Bible also says that we must speak. We must speak this gospel. So it's more than what we would call the social gospel. Yet our deeds, our lifestyle, our behavior, our faith, for many times makes our message authentic to people. It doesn't look like you're a used car salesman trying to like get somebody to you know, sign on the dotted line, right? It's like, wow, these people really care. They really love. They care for my family. They care for me. They've exhibited it. I look at their life. I look at the joy. I look at the peace. I look at the transformation. They look authentic. I'm hearing what they're saying. And we see God do transformational work. But this mission must be a consuming passion for the whole church. It can't just be for a few special elite people like missionaries or pastors or people who graduated from seminary or people who get paid to be a Christian. Have you ever heard of the Westminster Confession of Faith? Some of you have, maybe some of you haven't. If you were to go on a website right now, if you're searching for a church or you're just interested in any church in general, you go on a pretty much anybody's website, they almost always will have a mission statement. They'll kind of throw out a, a, a vision statement. And they always, almost always have a statement of faith. Have you seen these as you looked at church? And basically a statement of faith is that body of believers kind of putting this whole book and all the things that are critical in this book and kind of condensing them in to a statement in written form so that when other people could see this statement, they get a very good understanding of, okay, what does this church believe about God? What does the church believe about Christ or salvation and end times? Or what, is, what does the church believe about this word? Is it inspired and inerrant or infallible, or is it just a cool history book? You know, and that's what a statement of faith does. Well, before statement of faiths existed, they were called confessions back in those times. And we're talking about more like the 1600s when the Reformation happened. And they would write these confessions. And the Westminster Confession was about 151, I believe it was, theologians coming together to write a confession to take kind of this book, which now is in the hands of the common folk and not just the elite. And it's no longer in Latin. Everybody can see it and read it and know it in their own language. Praise God. The printing press changed and transformed this book into the hands of people. And so they're saying, this is what... The Bible is looking at and teaching in the Westminster Confession for most people is probably the most comprehensive, systematic expression of historic Christianity or theology that's probably ever existed in written form on paper. And chapter three of the Westminster Confession is entitled God's Eternal Decrees. And in chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession, you have something that goes into things like predestination and the sovereignty of God and the free will of humanity, the things that people have debated in seminaries and, and throughout the years have debated as well. It's got all that good, juicy stuff that a lot of people who love the word and theology and doctrine love to talk about and to study because it's important. And chapter 3 begins with these words. So I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to read you the words that begin with chapter 3. God, from all eternity, did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Ray, what did you just read? <laughs> right? You're reading, pick up an old book, and you're like, okay, I'm going to read this. I can't wait to read the C.S. Lewis book or something like that. And you're like, wow, I have to really read this one slow. Let me, let me put this in just like simpler terms, okay, or what they're trying to say. God from all eternity, God from all eternity, according to his counsel, freely and unchangeably ordained whatever comes to pass. That's basically what they're saying in the Westminster Confession, at least as it starts. 
Now, here's my question. How many of you believe that? That God ordains whatsoever to come to pass. And we love when the story, and we love to praise the sovereignty of God, and we love to say that God ordains things when things go our way, amen? Like last night, Sarah and I were able to step away, and we had a date night, and kids were with my parents, and uh, we were able to get away, and we were out in Palm Desert at, a, at an event. It was phenomenal. And, and uh, we get to this event, and there's this long line of traffic on the 10 freeway. We're like, oh, man, like we have 15 minutes before this event begins. We're not getting there. And my maps automatically rerouted me. I'm going, ah, that doesn't look like an effective route, but let's just do it anyway. And it got us to this little side parking lot. We ditched all the traffic, and uh, we parked there because somebody was just pulling out. And we parked in this little small parking lot. Where, where do we go? And so we eventually go to our events, and we had a great time. And uh, as we're walking out of the events, we walk out of the doors, and we're about 25 feet away, and there's our car. We're like, this is great. We're the first one out of here. We don't have to sit in traffic. And, and we were able to head home, and we're like, man, God is good. He ordained this. He is sovereign. Like, he's on top of it. Uh, but is God ordaining whatsoever, even the bad stuff? Because if we say yes to one, like, how, how do you not able to say yes to the other? And this is what is the really challenging piece. This is why I ask you, do you really believe that? That God for ordains everything that happens, yet we're not robots, and yet we do have choice, and we do have freedom? How is this to be? How do we talk about natural disasters or car wrecks or suffering through illnesses birth of babies and the death of babies. How do we look at that? Does God ordain everything that comes to pass or does he not? And if God does not ordain everything that comes to pass, does that then make by default that people who think that, which means God's not in control of everything, God is not knowing of everything, doesn't that make us by default an agnostic? or maybe even an atheist. And the difference between agnostic and atheist, just because I'm going to use this term a little bit, is an agnostic is somebody who lives like there's no God, yet opens up a little sliver of an opportunity, or maybe, <laughs> just maybe. I'll, I'll grant you the discussion. Maybe he's real. I don't have all knowledge. But from everything I see, everything that science has shown me, everything that I know in my own heart, there is no God out there. I'm an agnostic. I'm not going to take that final step and say there is no God because an agnostic is also a thinking person which says, well, if I were to make a claim that there is no God, I'm making a, a truth claim. And for order me to make a truth claim, i got to have all knowledge to make such a truth claim. And so since I don't have all knowledge, I can't say there is no God, but all the evidence shows me, all the circumstantial evidence shows me that there must be no God. And so that's an agnostic. So if we don't believe that God foreordains everything, that God's in control and sovereign, that things happen by chance or coincidence, then we're basically confessing and praising to a God that is really not a God by definition. And so far what I've read from the Westminster Statement has nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, anybody could read this. Uh, any functioning Jewish person, a Muslim, any theist that believes in the concept of God could affirm this, that God is sovereign over everything that happens. That's the basic definition of who God is. Augustine in fourth century, he said something very um, similar to this. He kind of kicked the ball rolling on trying for us to, as people to understand the sovereignty of God and God ordaining things. Uh, he made a comment and he said that God makes everything come to pass. But he says there's this passive sense to this as well. And he calls this God's will of permission, which he says, when you and I sin, God is not endorsing that. God is not putting a stamp of approval on it. But God's permissive will, he's permitting you to sin. In the sense of, he doesn't stop you from doing it. And all of us could go, I totally agree with that one, right? <laughs> But what it means for God to have ordain is that God at any moment, at any time, in the midst of a sin, 
can, if he so chooses to, to stop it, to stop you, to squash you like a bug or me like a bug, to stop us in our tracks, to Apostle Paul, I'm going to go persecute, I'm going to Damascus, I'm going to get those Christians and stop them in his tracks. God has that ability and that capability to do that. That's what Augustine is saying here. This is the passive will of God. So the fact that God doesn't intervene or doesn't intrude or decides to let it go or let you do it doesn't mean he's giving his blessing to it, uh, but gave you the ability to do it without preventing him intervening. So he's, he's allowed it. He's permitted it. And now because God is absolutely sovereign over everything that comes to pass, we can still say this fits within the sovereignty of God. R.C. Sproul says it this way. He says, if there was one maverick molecule running loose in the cosmos beyond the scope of God's sovereignty, control, and authority, then you have no reason as a Christian to believe in the simple promise of any future that God has made. So if there's any rogue, radical molecule, or let's just say, let's just insert a human being in there. If there's rogue and radical human being, then we can never bank on what God says will happen in the future because it's left to chance. Or is God behind it in some way, shape, or form? Many of you know the story of George Washington and the French-Indian War. I didn't know this until I heard it, but did you know that George Washington was shot off of, I think, Four different times, his horses were shot and killed, but the bullets never hit him. That's pretty close. But there's one battle that George Washington, when he was young in his 20s in this French-Indian War, where the bullet, as he was riding on that horse, caught the back of his shirt in one side, right out the other, inches away from death, inches away from never, ever becoming the first president of the United States of America. So my question to you, did that happen by chance? Is there such thing as chance? We live in a time, our kids are in school. Youth group is going to the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon Caverns, which is a huge cave 200 feet below the Earth's surface. You're going to Death Valley. And one of the things that's going to happen when we go there is we're going to see a bunch of signs and plaques and history lessons on how old the earth is and how it came into formation and basically the origins of the earth. And what we're going to see and what you've heard before as well is like, how did this all come into to, to place? How did this all come into being? And the answer is going to be by time, chance, and random process. So chance has this power to create an outcome. But does it really? So I asked Pops this morning, I said, Pops, you got a quarter? And he goes, no, but he gave me a dollar. <laughs> okay, so he walks around with a dollar coin in his pocket. I don't know what he's doing with the dollar coin. I didn't even know these existed. Um, but if I were to flip this coin, uh, what is the outcome of heads or tails coming up on a flip? 50-50? Are you sure? Is it loaded? <laughs> you know me well, Lynn. You know me well. Yeah. Not a loaded because it came from Pops, unless it's loaded. And that's why you're carrying a dollar coin in your thing to trick people. So I kind of, I kind of, in my terminology, I just tricked you a little bit. I said, if I were to throw a head, if, if I were to throw a heads or tail, what would the outcome be? Well, if I threw this, either heads or tails will happen 100% of the time. Better way to phrase it. If I were to throw this coin up and it were to land on a heads, what is my outcome? 50, or now you're, I don't want to answer, right? Like, this is a trick. It's a one out of two chance, right? But what about the variables that could happen? Like, if I start with heads up, would that change that variable? Um, does my force, where I catch it, if I flip it, uh, air density? I mean, we have all these variables that can be baked in, but the very simplest way we could show, for an example, if I were to flip this coin and it were to land on heads, we would basically say you have a 50-50 chance. 
And so now my question to you is, does chance have the ability, the power, to make it heads or to make it tails? And we go, no, it's just, chance is just a mathematical symbol, uh, terminology that we use to, to just basically show the relative general outcome of what it could or could not be. But what we do with the universe, what we do in life, is we say, well, that just happened by chance. Or time, chance, and random process. And we realize that we're giving power to something called chance, and really there is no power in chance. Chance is not a, a being. It, it can't do anything. Chance is nothing. It's just purely terminology. And we live at a time where this is being foisted upon us. Now, let's actually get to the Bible, huh? <laughs> let's open up our Bibles to 1 Samuel 4. And, and what's happening here is a very interesting story in the Scriptures. We're about to talk about the Philistines. And if you know anything about the Philistines, almost everybody knows that they had this huge guy named Goliath. Remember Goliath? Okay, Goliath was a Philistine. Now, before Goliath walked the earth and, and David and him fought from the stones, before King David became King David, before that happened, the Philistines were the arch enemy of Israel. They were in the land, they were powerful, and they were over these five great cities these Philistines. And what we have with Israel right now is a guy named Eli. And Eli is a judge over Israel at this time. And they are at war. They're at battle. Remember, God has told this chosen group of people, this is your promised land. Eradicate the land. And get those out of here. So this is what's happening. And what's about to happen is they're about to go into battle. Israel with the Philistines. And as they go into battle, guess what happens? Israel loses they lose 4,000 men on the battlefield, and now they're humiliated. And so some of the soldiers and the leaders, they come back, they come to Eli, and they go, Eli, we've been humiliated on the battlefield. We have lost 4,000. We need to switch our strategy. And here's how we're going to switch the strategy. Eli, give us permission to go get the Ark of the Covenant. You remember what the Ark of the Covenant is? Ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments are in this ark. Aaron's budding staff is in this ark of the covenant. This is where the cherubim sit is, the mercy seat of God. The presence of God would dwell in the tabernacle or later in the temple where the ark of the covenant was at. And guess what? When Israel brings the ark of covenant into battle, guess who's going to win the battle? Because the presence of God is leading us and he's going before us and the power of the, the God who's called Yahweh, he will give us victory. So Eli... We just got humiliated. Let's get the ark. And let's go really show them what we're made of. And so Eli hears this. And he goes, okay, you have my blessing. Get the ark. And let's go clean house on these pagan Philistines who are in our land. So they amass a huge amount of people. They're going into a huge battle. The ark of the covenant is there. Look at, look at verse 5 real quick. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all of Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, oh no, what is this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they had learned that the Ark of the Lord was in the camp, the Philistines are afraid. For they said, a God has come into the camp, and they said, oh my gosh, woe is us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck down the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines are like, we're going to lose, but we're going out in honor. Because we'd rather die free men. You hear this in movies all the time. We'd rather die free men than be, have these people enslave us. And so they go to battle. And the Ark of the Covenant's there. And Eli, an old man, is sitting at the gate. In fact, it says he's 98 years old and he's lost, he's lost his sight by this time. He's still the judge. 
and a messenger comes back to Eli. And Eli is waiting. Okay, what happened on the battlefield? How did God give us victory? And the report comes back to Eli. We got slaughtered. We lost 30,000 men were slain in this battle. That's not the worst thing, Eli. Your two sons, they're also dead. No reaction from Eli yet. And it gets worse. The Philistines have taken the Ark of the Covenant. And upon hearing that, Eli falls down, breaks his neck, and dies in an instant. Not from hearing the slaughter, not from even hearing about his sons, but the Ark of the Covenant now is in the hands of the Philistines. That was too much for him to bear. Then it picks up, that's verse 18. If you look at verse 19, look what follows this. Right after this, it says, Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, that was one of his sons, was pregnant. So now this messenger is about to go to Phinehas' wife and say, Not only do we lose the battle, not only did you lose your husband, not only did you lose your father-in-law, but the ark has been captured. Immediately she goes into labor where she births a child but in birthing that child, she dies. So one of the women attending there, verse 20, about this time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, do not be afraid for you who have born a son. But she did not answer or pay any attention. And so this lady, unnamed lady in the scripture, named the child Ichabod. Ichabod saying, and this is what Ichabod means, the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. Devastating. Devastating. Now, the Philistines, on the other hand, they're not devastated, right? They are partying. They are celebrating. Not only did we win the battle, but we have caught the Hebrews' Ark of the Covenant. And so now it's in their possession. And what they did is they said, let's take this Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments and Aaron's uh, rod inside of there, and let's put it into our temple. And we, let's put it in one of our great cities, Ashdod. And Ashdod has Dagon, this god, this god of deity, is their lead supreme god of deity in the Philistines' faith and religion. And they're like, we're going to put the Ark of the Covenant at the feet of the statue, this huge statue of Dagon that we have. And we're going to put it in our temple and they did that to show who is supreme, not Yahweh. And so everybody's out partying. The priests are out partying. The magicians are out partying. And they come back the next day, according to the scriptures, and guess what happens? Dagon has fallen over and is now face down, prostrate in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And to which the priests are like, uh-oh, <laughs> that doesn't look good. Put this statue back up. Put the ark back at the feet and it must have been just chance that that happened coincidence and so they go out partying again so they're out partying they're having a good time they come back the next day Dagon has not only fallen but is now shattered into millions of pieces so now they're going yee that's really not good but maybe it's still chance and directly after that, if we were to read this text, the, the ESV, that's the version I'm using, says that this plague broke out. Remember before, they're like, oh man, that's the, the Yahweh, the God who put these plagues on Israel. Guess who gets hit with the plague instantly right after that? These Philistines and Ashdod. They get hit with the plague of tumors. Now, some say... More graphically, when they take that Hebrew, it was a, uh, a plague of hemorrhoids. <laughs> so whether it was tumor or hemorrhoids, I don't think you want either one. But that's what hit them. Everybody's got this. And it's not only that, now the, uh, the city is being overrun by another plague of, of rats or of mice. These rodents 
infecting and disgusting everywhere. And they're going, I wonder if there's a connection, since we brought this Ark of the Covenant in, that Dagon has not only fallen, not only shattered into pieces, now a whole plague is broken out of us, and the king's going, I think there could be a connection. So I love my brothers in one of the other Philistine cities. Let's send the Ark of the Covenant to that city. And we'll say, let's put the Ark on, on like a tour, a parade of the greatest five Philistine cities. So everybody in the Philistines will know that we beat the Hebrew God, so let's get rid of it. And let them rejoice and let the people know that we have, we have, we have beaten them. So guess what happens when the Ark goes to the next city? plague of hemorrhoids or tumors, and rats. They're like, get it out of this city. They take it to the third city. Same thing, same thing. All five, all five get these two plagues hitting them. And then eventually they're coming to a place where we're going, I think we have a problem. <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 1, the ark of the Lord was in the county of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for their priest and the diviners, and said, what shall we do with this ark of the Lord? Tell us what we shall send it to its place. They're basically saying, we got to get rid of send it back. Send it back where it came from. These, these priests, they said, if, if you're going to send away the ark of God, of Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return it to him, basically. Return it to him a guilt offering. Okay, so what is this guilt offering? And they're saying you're going to be healed if you send it with this guilt offering. Jump down to verse 4. And they said, what is the guilt offering that we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden tumors and five golden mice, okay, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was all on you and on your lords. So you must make images of your tumors and the images of these mice that have ravaged the land and give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand off from you and your gods and of your land. So this is what they're going to do. So now they got to get two cows. This is what they're looking to do. Jump down to verse 7. And they're going to prepare a new cart with two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them and take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put it in a box at its side, the figures of the gold, which you're returning to him as a guilt offering and then send it off and let it go on its way and watch. If you take a mother cow that just had kids and you get rid of the babies, the natural movement of the mother is to do what? Go back to their babies, right? So the Philistines, even in this moment, are trying to stack the deck. They're basically like, we're going to do a test. Is all these things happening to us by chance or by coincidence? Or is God behind this? Let's set up a test. Let's get these five golden tumors. Let's get these five mice. Let's take the ark. Let's put it on the cart. Let's get two new cows that have just given birth, that have calves, and that have never been yoked before. They don't even know how to, like, They've never felt it. They don't even know what they're doing. They get yoked with this cart to them, and let's just send them off. And if, if they go to Israel, then we know God's behind this. But even as they're doing that, they're trying to stack the deck in their favor, are they not? Look at verse 9. If it goes up on the way to its own land, to Bethemish, then it is he who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it, was, that it is not his hand that struck us. And look at the very end of it. It happened to us by coincidence or by chance. This terrible outbreak, this plague of rats, this plague of tumors, Dagon their God busted and destroyed, Maybe all of that was by chance. So they only saw two possibilities. Either God is behind this, or it was purely chance. And we would look at this, and we kind of laugh, and we kind of know the end of the story, many of us, and we go, yeah, this is not by chance, come on. But I want you to look and think about the Philistines, these barbaric, simplistic people, right? 
They were religious. They had their own gods. They were a religious community. They were ruling the world at this time. They were over some of the greatest cities. They were functioning, religious, passionate people. But the outworking of their faith or their religion ultimately comes back to maybe it all happens by chance. So what we see here is that these Philistines are really functioning agnostics because they're giving chance power. Maybe everything that's happening to us is by chance. So even though we worship these gods and even though we give praise to these gods and even though our community has passion for these gods, maybe it's all by chance. And as Christians, I don't think uh, at any time you and I have ever come across a Christian that says, I don't believe in the sovereignty of God. I don't believe that God's all-powerful. I mean, that's the definition of God. But if you just drill down for about five minutes, you'll probably find that about one in a thousand actually maybe believe in the sovereignty of God, maybe one in a hundred. Because as soon as you begin to examine a little bit, as soon as you dive into those tough conversations, what you and I find is very little sovereignty left and that God is not sovereign at all. And if, but if God is not sovereign, then God is not God. So the Philistines, with their doctrine of chance, are basically agnostic. And a long time, they've lived a long time ago. This is before science. This is before Darwin. This is before 21st century technology and medicine. They're this simplistic, barbaric people that believed in chance. And that doesn't happen today, right? <laughs> Look what happens in verse 10 of chapter 6. The men did so. They took the two milk cows, they yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors, and the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and when they lifted up their eyes, they saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and it stopped there, and a great stone was there, and they split up the wood. And if I were to keep reading, here's what happened. They're rejoicing. The ark has come back. These, these cows have stopped on a stone. Let's take apart the cart. Let's preserve the ark, and let's barbecue, basically. Let's put an altar, and these cows, which didn't look to the right or left, went to an altar, The people were celebrating the return of the presence of God back to Israel. And here's what I want to talk about this story and brought it up this morning. And here is what we need to understand as we understand the very nature of God is a missional God who our God is on mission. Christ is the apex of this mission. You and I are conformed into the image of Christ. Christ has come to save and to seek that which is lost. So as God is on mission, as we're being conformed to his image, we should be on this same mission. But what stops many of us from the mission is we still come to a place where we no longer believe in a sovereign God who ordains things to come to pass. We still walk very similar to Philistines, very religious, very passionate, do a lot of religious services and duties, but we still believe this is all by chance. But nothing happens by chance. If God is God, he is sovereign. Nothing happens by chance. Now, do you believe that? And if you believe that, do you believe and do you think that God has left your redemption up to chance? 
And do you think that God has left the redemption of souls up to chance? God sent a lamb on a mission. The sovereign God ordained from the foundation of the world that this lamb will go to an altar to be slain and sacrificed. This lamb was led to the slaughter, did not open of his mouth, did not turn to the left or to the right, but he set his face towards Jerusalem to the place of sacrifice. Do you think that happened by chance? Do you think the Lamb of God went forth to die by chance? Or did God from the foundation of the world freely, immutably, by his own wise counsel and will, ordain that it should come to pass? And now as we go reach the lost with the greatest news in the world, representing our king who is in control of all things, who said all authority has been given to me, we can walk in such a way in victory, knowing that God will bring to pass exactly the mission he wants to bring to pass. And he's called you and I to be a means to share this news. And we, once again, are to worry about the outcome. That's his job. Our job is to be faithful representatives of Jesus Christ. And let God do the work that he's going to do. Let us not leave and believe and think that everything is left up to chance. God is in control. We need him to control us a little more frequently. Amen? Let's stop and pray with that. Father, as we close, especially as we talk about evangelism, Lord, because this is the scariest thing, I think, of Christianity, for us to not go to church and not to sing songs and uh, not to even be kind and live out our faith and be good to culture and society. I mean, none of these things, Lord. What scares us and what builds up fear is sharing this good news of what you've done in our lives to others. It, it it can handicap many of us. It's an inborn fear in that. And maybe part of it is just because we constantly think that everything that's happening, we've just bought into the world system, that it's, it's all happening by chance. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's just rogue people and rogue molecules that, God, you are not sovereign. You are not in control. But that's not the case. You are in control. You are sovereign. Nothing escapes you. And Father, as we get an opportunity, as these weeks unfold for us to not only see your nature of your heart, which is missional, and that you're on mission, that, Lord, we will be emboldened to be able to be on this mission more frequently and not just keep living like, like chance is going to make this happen. God, you're going to make it happen. We can walk into victory that every person that we share the good news with is glorifying you, is accomplishing your purposes. And Father, if there's anybody in this room this morning who's come to this place to hear about Christ, whatever drew you here, do you realize that the God of the universe is seeking and to save that which is lost, and that could be you this morning. And when I say lost, obviously you know where you're at spiritually in connection with God. And maybe the Lord has pressed upon your heart, only he can do, for you to repent, to confess that you're indeed a sinner, and to believe upon Jesus Christ as the only remedy of your lostness, and to bring you back into proper relationship to the God of the universe. Lord, we love you, and we pray all this in your wonderful name. And Father, as we get to sing about how great you are, part of why we're singing how great you are is because you are the God in control of all things. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.